Shrestha IT, a company based in Belgaum, where we build and secure, secure networks. I'm also a, a network engineer, um, primarily into, uh, with a varied wide of interest in, in Unix systems as well as networking and security. So as with uh, any network, uh, uh, a few of the challenges with respect to networks of uh, micro, small, medium enterprises um, in tier 2 and tier 3 cities are uh, some of the challenges which I've given here. One is uh, you have these elements of uh, phishing links which are uh, greatly circulated in the network. Then you have a, you know, the, the malware which is basically ransomware. Apart from that, uh, threat vectors which are primarily used for transferring of files which can again propagate stuff in the network. So it's pretty similar to what you have in any other network, but this is kind of uh, compounded by uh, another element uh, which is primarily uh, is, is, is uh, there in the tier 2, tier 3 networks of MSMEs is primarily a concept called as a flat network. So what is basically a flat network? A flat network is, is, is a network where um, the communication between uh, nodes or clients or computers is not segmented. So each computer can speak to one another without any kind of lim limitations for that matter. And that also has its own share of uh, problems. Uh, one of the reasons why also this kind of a topology is uh, chosen is because of uh, there is a low cost barrier to it. Uh, anyone can set up a flat network without having to put expensive hardware or having any kind of uh, you know technical know-how in order to put it. So here is a, a simple example of a, of a flat network. Um, as you can see, um, the, the computers or the servers which are there are all part of the network can communicate with one another without any kind of restrictions to it. So uh, what this also does is primarily uh, kind of, apart from the good traffic, it also um, gives uh, an ecosystem for the bad traffic as well with respect to property. Examples of a flat network, uh, typically you are running a network at home, you have wireless, you are running a flat network for that matter. Uh, a Soho office, uh, 100 plus networks which we serve in, in tier 2, tier 3 cities. Now you mix this with uh, uh, ignorance with respect to uh, security hygiene, uh, where if I have to give a few examples, uh, user would uh, have an antivirus installed on the system, but the antivirus is either not updated or the license has expired. Um, another example which you can point out is uh, pen drives which get connected to the systems. Basically, uh, the antivirus would pop up and the user would, instead of having the scan complete, the user would click on cancel. So thereby, you know, uh, to primarily to save time, but actually having a uh, consequence of uh, malware or bad data coming into the, into the system or the network. Um, another thing which we have found uh, very commonly is uh, everybody is logged in as an administrator user. So there is uh, no privileges uh, uh, per se with respect to restrictions on the system level. And, and, and lastly is basically the, the lack of uh, IT processes. So here is an example of, of a phishing email uh, which one of the uh, uh, customers we have uh, received and I have, I have primarily um, removed the stuff with respect to the email details. But this is, so if you had clicked on any one of those, any one of those links in that email, this is what you would have seen, uh, which is nothing but a, a phishing email and not, not something by Microsoft for that matter. Um, before I actually go into the uh, solution side of things, I will probably give a just a small primer with respect to DNS. Uh, before I do that, how many people have worked or have an experience with respect to uh, configuring a DNS server? How many people know how DNS works? Oh, that's probably a fair bit. So I'll, I'll just skip through this, uh, this slide. So what you have is basically a, a computer at the very left of the slide, which is basically where a user is accessing a, a let's say a web resource or a website uh, on the computer, or it could be a mobile device. And the request is uh, for an IP address, that is a resolution from the name to an IP. And this is something which is done by something called as a recursive DNS resolver. Um, Generically, uh, this is the job of an ISP. The ISP, so when you connect to an internet connection, the ISP gives you a, uh, a DNS server IP, which is what does the recursion with respect to getting an IP with respect to the resource, right? Uh, but it's a lost art these days, uh, and I'll come to that where ISPs have actually outsourced this to uh, uh, various cloud providers. Uh, you have the Google 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8 .8. 
you have Cloudflare 1.1.1.1 and you also have the quad 9 which is 9.9.9.9 .9 .9. so these are basically what gets used by everyone primarily for the for the fallacy of security as well as uh, you know the res resolution is also fast so uh, my focus is primarily on the recursive dns aspect so i'm not i'm not going to go into the details with respect to the authoritative dns or uh, the root dns for that matter so the security element which uh, probably i am proposing is on the recursive side of things um, also another option with respect to uh, people who are running their own uh, recursive DNS servers would ideally be using something like uh, open source software which is bind or unbound or power DNS which at so this point I will probably get back to a little while later. So how does a DNS firewall help? Uh, DNS firewall, uh, so if, if you look at from a threat intelligence perspective or even if you look at from a security perspective right, everything begins with a DNS query right. So it be it, a, be it good traffic or be it bad traffic everything starts with a DNS query. So having a kind of a mechanism with which you can filter bad DNS traffic right without even it going in other layers adds a lot of uh, value from, from the network uh, security hygiene perspective. Um, so primarily it sets a differentiated route. There is a firewall which actually gave that pop-up as well. Uh, so there is a set of differentiated route for the DNS queries. Uh, most importantly for the MSME networks that we have uh, primarily deployed this, it's, it's cheap defense, right? Without having to invest in a full-fledged firewall or without having the capabilities of having the, the budget for a, something like a PF sense for that matter. Uh, this adds a lot of value because it, this is typically just goes on something like a Raspberry Pi, right? So low cost barrier with respect to the uh, economic side of things and uh, pretty simple to uh, implement uh, once you get it right. Uh, having said that, I would like to highlight it uh, multiple times that security is primarily a you know, multi-tiered approach. So I am in no way I am suggesting that just putting this thing in your network is going to secure it. So this is one of the key elements that can actually go in your you know, network defense for that matter. So what you have is basically a vendor neutral distributed format. Or, or it's not actually not a protocol yet. It's uh, hopefully it, it should be. Uh, there is a there is a draft that is published on the ITF website uh, since I believe for the last four to five years. But this is one of the underrated topics on on the DNS side of things, which one can leverage. So what it does is it allows you just like any other firewall. It allows you to um, set policies based on uh, who is asking the question or where that question is going to. Uh, to add to this, you can integrate something called as threat intelligence feeds. So, uh, and then it becomes a full blown firewall. And there are a lot of uh, providers available which are open source as well as proprietary, which can, uh, you know, uh, plug in into your DNS firewall, giving you a greater uh, leverage. And uh, the, for that matter, the, the three primary uh, DNS software which, which, which is available as an open source option, one is Bind. So bind version 9.10 greater onwards basically supports this. PowerDNS also has this. Unbound just I think a few days back uh, there is a patch that has gone into the main uh, source code where response policy zones is basically going to be available in Unbound as well. So just like any firewall for that matter, um, the working of a DNS firewall is very similar. Uh, there is basically something called as uh, a condition is met and then you have a action for it. So you have a trigger and then an action gets called. So I'll, I'll probably uh, give a demo of a couple of examples as well. So the first one, let's say for example, Q name that stands for query name. So if the query name is this specific DNS record, then you can have an action where you can say that, okay, I want to drop it. Or I can, I, I want to give a response back to the client machine saying that this is a non-existing domain. So the NX domain stands for non-existing domain. Uh, before I actually give you a demo, uh, let me uh, go through a sample uh, DNS zone file so that uh, you know you understand uh, the nitty gritties of how this gets integrated. Uh, instead of going through the whole thing, I'll probably just concentrate on the last uh, three lines of the of the image. So what you have there is basically these are called as resource records. Uh, so in this case, what I'm what, what we are saying is webmail dot instapping dot in is pointing to the IP address one zero six dot two zero one dot one twenty five dot seven. Uh, the second one is again uh, a resource called as www.instapping.in 
which is pointing to IP address 122.252.225.22, right? That's how basically DNS works, right? Now here is an example of a DNS response policy zone file. So in the case of a response policy zone file, again it is a zone file. The structure is a little bit different. So here you can see that uh, there are a list of uh, uh, DNS records. Now here these DNS records, I am not authoritative to it, right? It is just my recursive DNS server which I am I'm going to give these records in the, uh, in the uh, recursive DNS server and I am going to say CNAME dot, dot means NX domain. So what I'm trying to say is it's like null root, it's like dev null. So if I want to send it to something like a recycle bin, let's say a DNS query, this is what it would entail. Right? Uh, so in, in any kind of uh, open source DNS software, you would have to include this zone file uh, and, and tell the software saying that here is a zone file and here are the resource records inside it and I, and I want you to primarily respond to it, right? Instead of going upper in the chain, to find out what is the actual IP address of that record, I want you to uh, find, uh, get it locally and give an NX domain answer in this case, right? And then you include basically saying that uh, this is a response policy zone. Uh, what I'll do is I'll probably show you a, a small demo of this. Right, so I'll probably pause it uh, every now and then. So what I'm doing is basically I'm saying, uh, Big, yes, I will try to do that. Does that help? Uh, let me run through it so that you get an idea about it. So basically, I have opened a terminal here and I'm, I'm, and I'm typing a command which is dig. So dig is basically available on Unix and Linux systems which basically allows you to query a DNS record. Uh, so I'm saying dig at the rate. 127.0.0.1 which is localhost, which is my self system, that is the same system itself, for the resource record which is google.com, right? And what I see now here as an output is basically the answer where Google, IP address of Google is 216.58.197.46, right? So I got the answer where the recursive DNS resolver actually went up the chain, found out what is the IP address of google.com and gave it back to me. Any questions here? So now what I'm doing is basically uh, I have this uh, response policy zone, right? So in one of the response policy zone, the zone file which I have generated, the format which I showed you I think a couple of slides back, I am searching for uh, a string called as PayPal, right? So I, I run, I've run a, uh, what do you call it, a command line argument which says, which says that grep PayPal in this specific zone file just to actually demo you what will happen if I request a resource which is a phishing link, right? Yes, zone file is on my machine. So I am running this recursive DNS resolver on my machine itself. Actually this is a video so I am not doing it right now but this is something which I recorded where I put the recursive DNS server on my machine. So you could actually do this, if you don't want to do this for your network you can also do it only for your system itself. So you, it need not be that the requirement is that you have to only do this for if you have a network. So now what I'm doing is I'm saying dig at the rate uh, localhost and the resource record is one of the phishing links, one of the DNS domain names which is nothing but a phishing link, right? It is paypal-account.ogspy.net. Uh, the word PayPal itself basically can fool a lot of people who are not in the, from the technical side of things where they would look at PayPal and they would say, oh, okay, this is PayPal, let me log in, right? So now what this does is because the recursive DNS resolver which I have has a record for this specific DNS and I've said respond back with NX domain. When you ask that question, it doesn't give you an answer. It gives you NX domain. So it doesn't give an IP. Even though on the internet, this record might be resolving. So I, uh, the next thing what I do is I actually run this against the Google's uh, quad 8 recursive DNS resolver and you will see that it actually responds which means that people who would access that link, right, you will see that it has given those IPs, right. 
So the query that I gave here was dig at the rate 8.8.8.8, .8 that same domain name, which is a phishing domain. And you're getting a response there, which means that anyone who is using Google DNS for that matter at this point of time accesses that link and is probably not aware that this is a phishing link, right, is going to fall for it. Right, so uh, to uh, populate with respect to what you uh, might already have with respect to a DNS uh, uh, response policy zones, what we primarily uh, did was we looked into the reputation feeds. So there are a lot of reputation feeds, URL house is one, spam house is another, far side security. Or you can also create your own feeds. There are a lot of reputation pro providers which are primarily having this data in an open source format where you can actually do a pull every, every now and then. And um, it's basically a, just a URL which you download and then put, uh, populate this records inside a zone file and your network will now not resolve those DNS requests. So some of the lessons what we, uh, after doing this uh, for uh, 100 plus networks is one, one of the things which we uh, realized was a lot of false positives going in it. Uh, the data, the zone files that you populate needs to be uh, in a, in a in a pristine manner with respect to not having to, you know, having put something which is legitimate uh, domain name for that matter or a DNS record. Uh, monitoring and analysis is primarily at the log file level. So you are typically tailing the log file to see what kind of request is getting blocked for that matter. Um, you can also integrate something like an ELK stack which can give you pretty uh, graphs and, uh, you know, charts for that matter. So if, I have, if there is one takeaway that I, I'd like to uh, point out uh, people here is even if you are running a network or not or even if you would be interested in doing something like this for your, for your home network is primarily run a recursive DNS resolver even on your laptops with response policy zones and that adds a lot of value with respect to uh, stopping uh, uh, malware or, or phishing link or anything for that matter at the DNS level itself. So you could do that by uh, having a simple, uh, so if you're running Linux or Unix, you just put bind uh, uh, or, or open uh, your power DNS or unbound. Uh, you could also use something like a pi hole. So pi hole is a project which is on technically, but if I have to, even before I go there, pi hole is not response policy zones. Uh, pi hole is basically going to block it for everyone in the network. It is not going to be selective. There are no policies there. It is a blanket ban for everyone. But that is something that you can explore and this is what the Pi Hole project looks like. You basically just take a Raspberry Pi and uh, put the Pi Hole software in it. It's nothing but DNS mask which runs behind the scenes and it will allow you to block DNS and you'll be surprised to, to know uh, what kind of DNS requests your, uh, your Alexa or your, or, your, or your TV is making uh, you know, every now and then, even when you're not watching it for that matter. Uh, future challenges. Um, there is this new protocol uh, which exists uh, called as uh, DOH, that is DNS over HTTPS. And there is a lot of noise with respect to DOH for that matter where uh, there are people who want DOH and there are people who do not want uh, DOH. Now, from my perspective, uh, very importantly, it's biased because I run a recursive DNS resolver for customers, uh, you know, 100 plus networks for that matter. So definitely I will not want uh, DOH for that matter, but as a user, DOH as a protocol, which is RFC 8484 is extremely important and, and it's, a, it's a great step forward. The problem lies with the way it is getting implemented by, uh, by Mozilla, right? So if you don't know what is happening in that space, so if you're running a Mozilla Firefox browser, uh, even though you might be having a recursive DNS resolver or you're part of a corporate network which has your internal DNS mapped, right? It'll all stop working uh, uh, probably pretty soon in India as well. Uh, starting October, uh, DOH gets rolled out for all users in the US, which means which, which means that any DNS query that you are making will go to Cloudflare. Right? Again, I do not have anything against Cloudflare because I have a lot of friends in it. But uh, the question becomes: On one side, you have DOH, which says it is privacy, and then and on the other side, you have centralization, which is going to a private company. Uh, so that is something that is a challenge if you're using response policy zones. But my message to you as well as to Mozilla is uh, probably uh, Mozilla is to step away from DOH in the way it is getting implemented. 
probably take a much saner way of doing it the way Google is doing, uh, where now there is a way to actually block DOH if you're running an enterprise network, where you don't want the, 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 all your traffic, all your DNS traffic to go to, let's say, Cloudflare for that matter. But uh, it's, it's actually uh, still something which is not yet clear, right? So there has been a lot of, uh, you know, a couple of malware which is actually has, uh, uh, you know, started using DOH as a, as a transport mechanism where it is now purely hidden inside the DNS or HTTPS uh, stream, right? And that's pretty much a challenge for that matter. Uh, here are the references. I, the slides are already there on the uh, website for that matter, but I think I'll also tweak it out and uh, I would be happy to take any questions or comments you may have. So, uh, how, um, why it is important to do um, the de uh, blocking as part of DNS itself? Are right. there other ways to achieve this? Right. So, uh, there are multiple ways to do it. I mean, the traditional way is to put a, a full-fledged firewall, uh, which will act at the different layers of the network uh, stack for that matter. Uh, but then the problem that we have uh, seen with respect to, let's say for example, PFSense, right? PFSense is basically a, a packet filter coming from the Unix world, which you just put it on a simple box and you put it in a network, plug it in the network and all your traffic will technically incoming and outgoing egress, ingress is basically through that. Uh, but that requires an investment of a machine, right? That requires primarily that uh, barrier from an economical standpoint. So a lot of businesses that we cater to, uh, as I said, there is a large scale ignorance with respect to security hygiene. So putting a, a, a full-fledged firewall there becomes a big barrier, but at the same time, we want to make sure that the ecosystem is, is improving from, from that level. So this becomes one of the uh, uh, key elements which can actually solve a number of problems, right? Where, where the phishing links and, and, and let's say malware which is there in the network does not get propagated because it gets stopped at the DNS level. And it's always good to have multi-layered approach, right? So even in PFSense, you have uh, the same uh, mechanism of running a DNS response policy. I hope that answers your question. It is not. It is. It, it, it's one of the things that you can do from a from a network perspective. So let's say, for example, let me put it the other way around. You're running a home network. I don't think many of you would be interested to run a full-fledged firewall in your home, right? right? Because of the barrier. Because you have to, you know, put a machine there or a, or a box there and and manage it and maintain it, right? So this becomes a, a good incentive to have some layer of security apart from other layers which you may probably or you should be investing in. Hey, can we through the mic? Uh, what about IP tables? Uh, IP tables is primarily going to look at the from the IP layer. So it is not going to do at the DNS layer. So uh, you can pretty much configure a firewall in uh, IP tables for that matter, but it is all looking at ingress and outgress of IPs, that is IP addresses in the network coming in and going out, and whether connections are established, not established, or whether you want to block certain kind of protocols going out and stuff like that. But it will not do at the DNS level. Okay, thank you. Maybe to add to that, uh, IPs would, would not be so dynamic. DNS is intended to be dynamic. Right. If it changes, uh, then you're blocking basically an old IP. Right, okay. absolutely. In fact, to add to that, uh, there is another layer uh, that you can actually go into. So a lot of these reputation feeds have data which is built on passive DNS, right? Passive DNS is basically, let's say there is a, there is a, uh, a domain name and it has an IP X. They look at on that X, that same X IP address, how many other domains are there, right? And if those are legitimate domains. If they are not, then they get added to the reputation feed. So that's how uh, you, you can actually have a dynamic layer of uh, blocking at the DNS layer. Yes, Swapnil, great presentation, uh, good insights. So uh, just to build on that same question, right? So every host, you have the firewall, either IP tables or Windows firewall. And if you're able to set up uh, your rules to control traffic on port 53, you, you're still controlling um, the DNS calls that are going out to different entities that your application deals with, right? 
So over and beyond that, what does the DNS firewall uh, offer? What advantage does it offer? A lot of advantages, in fact. Uh, just to point out, say for example, it is just the traffic which you are controlling which is going out. You are not controlling whether, let's say, abc.com should be blocked. Right? There is no, uh, uh, what do you call, a condition and a, and a uh, trigger and an action which says that, okay, say for example, here are the list of domain names which are malicious and I want in IP tables to block them, right. One, it, it, you can do that technically, but it is going to be a very uh, intensive affair with respect to whatever machine you would be running. So it is not scalable uh, at all. Uh, to remove a rule from that, to remove a domain name from that is going to be a, a massive job. Uh, I forgot to add one element to it. So uh, say for example, I have a network where I have set up a recursive DNS server and I have configured the response policy zones and I have put reputation feeds in it, right. Say for example, now I have 100 plus networks where I want this to be implemented. I configure this as a master DNS server, configure rest of them as slave, they will pull all data from here without me having to do anything at all in the sense that without having to reconfigure the same thing again and again. So you are using technically that is not part of response policy zones, that is part of the DNS system, the ecosystem where you have a master and a slave and you have these zone transfers, right. I hope that answers your question. I am going to go back to DOH. Uh, okay. So, I mean, uh, we have been reading about this, DOH is bad, do not do this, you know, a lot, lot of backlash uh, Mozilla has. Three questions. Sure. Is not it actually good that Mozilla is allowing you to do DOH? One, it is encrypted, it is no longer plain text. That means if you are on a telco network, nobody can monitor your, monetize your DNS usage anymore, right? Because in HTTPS, that's the only way they could have monetized it by accessing what DNS queries do you make. That was one. Second, take an example, UK or uh, recently it happened in Kazakhstan where they are actually now ISP. blocking IS via ISPs, right? DOH allows you to overcome that because you are no longer going to get blocked right. by your ISP on some content. Content is free on the internet. Point number three. You can always disable it in network TRR mode. You really don't have to enable it. Or last point that you made, you're an enterprise. You can't make a DOH by yourself. Change the network TRR URI. Implement your own HTTPS DNS resolver. That works, right? Excellent questions. Thanks for uh, bringing these questions. Well, I'll go one by one. So one is uh, when you say, so uh, from my perspective, uh, apart from the noise that is uh, happening on the internet, uh, DOH as a protocol is absolutely great, right? RFC 8484 is fantastic. But there existed DOT before DOH. So you had DNS over TLS, right? Which would have given, the, given you the same thing. But for some reason, that has been shelled and suddenly the project is DOH. That is number one. Question is not on whether DOH is good or bad. That's not what I am debating for. I am debating, am I fine with all my DNS queries going to Cloudflare? I am not. Where is going to your ISP and some other data monetization organization? No, but there is a different way to probably solve that problem, right? The, it, it may not be necessarily, having said that, there is also a mechanism now where you can disable DOH at the DNS recursive resolver. So they have come out with uh, a canary domain, used as application.net. Yeah. So if I put it in my response policy zones and say that this is NX domain, right? DOH gets disabled for every client in the network. So this is a new development that has come probably because of the back backlash. Having said that, it is, there are too many moving parts. Let's say for example, if I want to run my own DOH trusted recursive resolver, the TRR, right? right. I have to adhere to Firefox policies uh, with respect to a lot of things and there is no clarity on that at this point of time. My way of going forward would have been assuming that that is an option, exists for enterprise networks having a very valid case with respect to blocking or having internal DNS resource records, would have been a greater way of going forward rather than implementing it at, 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 at a user level and then saying, okay, we are also going to work on it, but not now. Do I get to ask one more question? Please. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe it's going to go tangential, so I'll stop there and probably speak with you later. Sure. Uh, when browser steps in to do all these things, 
you know, where they are now trying to protect user privacy at DNS level as well. Doesn't it ring the same bell what OCSPs did for CA certs as well? And Absolutely. Where you basically what the browsers of the world are trying to say that let us take matter in our own hands and give tools and leverages which actually benefit the user at the end of the day. I said this is slightly tangential because now we are talking about a philosophy here uh, with a bit of technology. But maybe you could add a comment on that. Wouldn't that be good still if you look at it from that perspective? I think any kind of uh, centralization is not good. That is how I would look at it uh, as a user, not from a business perspective for that matter. Uh, I'm old school. I, I love the decentralization of things where the way DNS works at this point is, is great. It is scalable. I, I've never seen DNS failing for that matter for all the time that I've used internet because of the distributed nature of DNS, right? I've never seen it failing at all, right? So now changing it to making it centralized, saying that on one part we want users to be secure and then sending it to a private company who says that we are not going to, who has a background with respect to uh, promoting content with respect to 4chan for that matter. I mean, we are talking about a political, that's a, the that's a reason why I'm wearing a t-shirt where it says that there are nine layers. So there are two layers which is on the political side as well, uh, financial side and then there is a technical side. Maybe it depends on which layer we are talking about. I hope that answers. Sure. Thanks. Another thing that I would, I would like to add, this is again a personal opinion. Uh, Cloudflare versus my ISP, which is located in my country. This is, uh, uh, and my ISP is in my country. I may have legal avenues to either safeguard my privacy in my own country. Uh, whereas in Cloudflare, which is based in US, even though we say DOH would offer privacy against my ISP, but I don't have legal avenues to, to really follow up with them. I'm not using the word sue. But, but uh, so Cloudflare or any other con uh, IS, uh, provider which is there in let's say UK or US, they may be subject to uh, their own legal law, like national security letters, wherein they cannot talk about uh, disclosures. So again, this is my personal opinion. So uh, just to add to this, uh, so there was, I think uh, somebody was talking about, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the, uh, forgetting the name of the speaker, is about NSA, right? and um, uh, stuff like that. So now you have made everything centralized, right? So now there is only one place that anyone has to go to get all the DNS records which anyone is accessing instead of the distributed nature, right? Uh, you guys keep saying this that, you know, like it's going to go to Cloudflare. It is you, going to Cloudflare. No, you realize it's default. You can change that. Question is, uh, at the, let's from a business perspective. At a perspective, browser level, you can change that. I agree. So here, uh, okay, let me give you an example. No, when I mean, it's like saying 8.8.8 .8 is bad. I mean, change it. It's not tough. Agreed, agreed. But here is, here is a viewpoint which I'll give you. Let's take the uh, situation with respect to the kind of markets that we are serving, non-technical. So when a pop-up comes on Firefox which says that, hey, secure fast browsing, click OK. This is exactly what primarily what Free Basics movement started out on Facebook where we want to, you know, oh, we want, we want, we are taking internet to the rural public, support this. And then a reply went to try without having an understanding of what exactly is internet and what part of internet was getting served. So I think, now take your perspective there and you think and say, do you think users understand what is happening here? You and me can change it, but do you think the kind of enterprise customers or, you know, layman people who are using the internet will understand what is happening behind the scenes? I, I don't think so. 